Yeah, the, the, I, I mean, there's a lot to say in response, but again, I, I, I'm not going to sure. I'm not going to pursue this further for sake of time. So. Um, I think we can go on to the, the sort of subject and accidents identification, um, or not identification, but banning, as it were, from uh, divine simplicity. So uh, the first, um, well, I guess one of the, I, I don't know if it's the first, but the, one of the central arguments that we're going to explore here is what's uh, called the aloneness argument. So the background for this is um, classical theism is committed to a thesis called aloneness, we can just call it that, which says that possibly God exists alone. That is to say, possibly God exists without any non-God thing existing whatsoever. The, in other words, in contemporary analytic speak, there is some possible world wherein only God exists. And this follows from two central claims of classical theism. Number one, things only have being insofar as God's created, insofar as God creatively bestows being to them. And number two, God is free to creatively bestow said being or not, right? If God's free not to do it, then it's possible that he, does, that he doesn't do it. And if there being anything extrinsic to God presupposes that God does it, well, then it's possible that God exists alone. So that's really the, the, the sort of background commitment. Um, and so I guess a simple aloneness argument, before we get into a sort of uh, much more complex one, but a simple one for heuristic purposes, would say something like premise one, if classical theism is true, then there cannot be a contingent, positive, ontological item within or intrinsic to God. Premise two, but there can be a contingent, uh, item intrinsic to God. And so premise three, or conclusion, so classical theism is false. And so for premise one, again, this is kind of just like a core commitment of classical theism, right? There can't be sort of contingent items intrinsic to God, because those would be accidents, and classical theism says God cannot have accidents. And so then premise two, there can be, remember what that says, it says there can be a contingent positive ontological item within God. Basically, we just say, okay, well, let's zoom in on the alone world. Okay, now in that world wherein God chooses not to create, uh, we would we would think that any positive ontological item in that world is intrinsic to God. Uh, by definition, there is literally nothing apart from God in such a world, and hence there is literally no positive ontological item extrinsic to God in such a world. And so what follows is that any positive ontological item in the world, in the alone world, is within or is intrinsic to God. Or put differently, God couldn't have extrinsic features in the alone world or extrinsic items since there is quite literally nothing extrinsic or external to God in such a world to which God could relationally stand. So that's kind of, that's we might motivate that. And then the next step would say something like, in a world wherein God chooses not to create, God contingently has some knowledge. And this means that God contingently has some kind of positive ontological item, like uh, contingent knowledge, for instance. Um, Proust, uh, 2018, Chapter 8, and Grant, uh, William Matthews Grant, 2012, they both explicitly grant this latter point, that, um, that, God has that God contingently has some knowledge, and this is precisely why they opt for a kind of extrinsic model of divine knowledge. But what the alone world does is, like, is going to say, hold on, you can't have extrinsicality in the alone world because any positive ontological item is intrinsic to God in the alone world. Um, and because God is omniscient, right, God knows all truths, and so because there are contingent truths in the alone world, right, wherein God chooses not to create, such contingent truths, an example would be God chooses not to create or Earth doesn't exist, right? It would follow that God only contingently has some knowledge in such a world. Um, and so from that, uh, we get that God uh, can have a contingent intrinsic item uh, because we, we got first that God could have existed alone, uh, and then any knowledge in such a world is intrinsic to God again because there aren't extrinsic positive ontological items. And from the previous step, we saw that such knowledge is, or some such knowledge is only contingently had by God. And so God could have something that is both contingent and intrinsic. And so God can have a contingent intrinsic feature or positive ontological item or whatever. Now, that's that's all by way of just sort of maybe briefly articulating it. There is a premise that that is in the longer version that Christopher wants to reject. And so I'll just give the longer version for you guys here. I'll do it briefly. And I won't motivate the premises further because that's what I just did earlier. So it says premise one, God's knowledge is either wholly intrinsic to God, wholly extrinsic to God, or intrinsic to God in some respects, but extrinsic to God in others. Premise two, but God's knowledge is wholly extrinsic to God or intrinsic to God in some respects, but extrinsic in others, only if God doesn't exist alone. And then premise three, possibly God exists alone. And from those, it follows that possibly God's knowledge is wholly intrinsic. Um, but premise five, necessarily God contingently has some knowledge or other. And so it follows that possibly God contingently has wholly intrinsic knowledge, 
but whatever is wholly intrinsic to S is either an essential feature of S or an accident of S. And of course, nothing God contingently has can be an essential feature of God. And so it follows that possibly God has an accident, which is incompatible with DDS or doctrine of divine simplicity. So I'll turn it over to Christopher. I know he has a, a premise that he likes to re he would like to reject. So I'll turn it over to you, Christopher. Okay, Good. let's get so, clear real, real quick before you come in, Chris. Uh, some people were noticing or noting in the, the live chat that this one was a little bit difficult to follow. So is there a way that you can break this down a little bit further, Joe, for people? It's like, can you give a summary of what the argument is? A quick, easy yeah, way to understand yeah. it. And I, I want to re, re, reiterate one more time. That if you're watching this live and you're just joining us, there's a description or there's a discussion brief linked in the description of this video that you can open up and it's actually got this argument listed out step by step. And so for me, I've got it pulled up over here on my screen so I can actually see what's happening. And it's it's really helpful to me. So I imagine it's also going to be helpful to you. And so as you're watching this, definitely take advantage of that, pull it up. But yes, yeah, so Joe, give me like a quick, easy to understand yeah. summary of what you just said. Yeah, yeah. So um, let's just assume the classical theism is true, right? Which means that there is a possible world where God exists alone without anything else existing. Mm -hmm. um, why is that the case? Well, because God is free to create, and under classical theism, there being anything apart from God already kind of presupposes that God created. So if God's free to create or not, well, then there is some possible world, right, wherein God just exists alone because he chose not to create, right? So we can call this the alone world. It's just a world where only God exists. God's just there. He's chilling. He's basking in his glory. He's just like, look at me. I'm so awesome. I'm so cool. Be jealous. So, so that, that's simple. what God's like in the alone world. <laughs> okay, so he, this is the alone world. Okay, now, any sort of thing that has reality in this world, any kind of positive ontological item, any feature, we can say, something that has being, whatever that is, that's going to have to be intrinsic to God. Why is that? Well, because there is nothing extrinsic to God in such a world, right? Anything extrinsic to God requires God to create it, right? Which means that if God doesn't create in this world, if he exists alone, there's nothing extrinsic to God. And so whatever has being in this world, whatever is a sort of positive ontological item, it's going to be intrinsic to God. It's going to be within God. But here's the rub. God contingently has some knowledge in this world. And what that means is that there's some kind of reality, God's knowledge, that's only contingently obtaining. Uh, because, precisely because, uh, the truths that God knows in such a world are contingent, right? You can't necessarily know something that is true, because uh, that would entail that the thing known is necessary. That's sort of, knowledge presupposes truth, so if you necessarily know something, then the thing known is, is necessary. But there are contingent truths in the alone world, right? God freely chose not, not to create. That's a contingent truth, and God's going to know that, and God's going to contingently know that. And again, Proust and William Matthews Grant agree that God contingently has um, knowledge or, or what have you. So what, when we put these together, right, we see that there is nothing extrinsic to God in the alone world. So whatever is in the alone world, whatever has some kind of being or reality, is going to be intrinsic to God. But we just found earlier that there's some sort of contingently obtaining reality, namely God's contingent knowledge. So what follows is that there's some kind of contingent reality within God. And that's not compatible with classical theism. According to classical yeah. theism, whatever is in God is necessarily had. It, he doesn't have any accidents that are sort of contingent intrinsic items within him. So hopefully that's a good summary. Yeah, yeah, that is. And so I think if I can anticipate how Chris is going to respond to this, it seems like it's going to be along the same lines of what we talked about earlier, where when we're thinking about knowledge, we can't just, what? how did you put it? We, from the, you know, we can't look at our knowledge and suppose that that's like, how God's knowledge operates. Can't can't say that that connection is exactly the same. It's not univocal. There you go. So is that is that how you're going to respond here? That's part of it. Um, I think there's something more fundamental going on here, though. So I, I want to begin by noting that, um, you know, Joe's done some um, important work here uh, in coming up with this argument. I think this is the, the best, um, you know, modal collapse kind of argument that I've seen. Um, and so I want to thank him for, uh, you know, presenting this. Um, now with that said, as, um, well, let me, and let me just add, I guess, a note of further explanation about where the argument's kind of coming from. So I think th this may or may not track the, uh, exact way in which Joe came up with the argument, but here's how I would have came up with this argument if I were thinking this way. So prior to like, thinking about the alone world, right? You might just think, well, look, 
Divine simplicity entails divine immutability. And immutability means God never changes. But God knows things. Um, and it, some of the things that God knows change, changes, right? Uh, I was once a boy, now I'm a man. Uh, when I was a boy, God knew that I was a boy. Now he knows that I'm a man. Um, and, you know, lots of other changes in the world. God knows about all these changes. So uh, God's knowing about the changes that are going on in the world looks like it's incompatible with immutability. And if we don't have immutability, uh, we don't have simplicity because simplicity entails immutability. Okay. So the way in which the classical tradition has responded to this, right, is is to say that divine knowledge um, has an extrinsic element. Um, now, I think this is actually true of creaturely knowledge for a reason as well, for a reason that I'll explain in a moment. But, you know, when we say that God knows something, um, that God knows that I'm a, I'm a man rather than a boy, um, that this can, that this difference in God's knowledge consists simply in the fact that I am a man rather than a boy, that and it, and in the fact that God is the is the cause of me as a man, uh, uh, and back when He knew that I was a boy, He was the cause of me as a boy. This is why in the classical tradition it's common to see um, classical uh, classical theists say that it, God's knowledge is the cause of things, right? So. Human beings, we look out on the world and we find out how it is and we try to conform our intellects to how the world is out there, okay? It's important to remember that with God, it goes the other way around. God does not look out on the world, at least not in the classical tradition. He does not look out on the world to find out what it's like and conform his beliefs, conform his intellect to what the world is like. Rather, right, he already knows what he wants to create. And he makes the world conform to that plan, to his beliefs, to his knowledge, right? Um, so uh, it go, there's a directionality of fit to knowledge, right? And it goes in the opposite direction depending on if you're talking about um, creaturely knowledge or divine knowledge. For creaturely knowledge, the direction of fit is intellect to world. For God, the direction of fit is world to intellect, Right. Um, uh, because God is the source of all the creatures and he creates them according to how he knows he wants them to be. OK, um, so that's the that's the important bit. So then I think what Joe is at it, right, is to say, well, look, that that um, that view might get you away from the the very simple problem of um, God's knowledge of changing things in the world. But. Let's think about the world where God exists all by himself. And in that world, it looks like God still knows some things, including some things that are contingent, such as that in that world, there are no dogs. Um, there could have been dogs, so it's contingent that there are no dogs. And yet God knows that there are no dogs. Um, and Joe wants to say, right, that that knowledge is, has to be intrinsic to God. It, you, can't, you can't use the extrinsic model of divine knowledge here precisely because in the alone world, there's nothing extrinsic to God, right? We, that's what we said, that, you know, he's, he exists alone. And it is, of course, a commitment of classical theism that God could have been alone. God could have um, just not created at all. Okay, so uh, now I did actually want to draw everybody's attention to the extended form of this argument, the one with uh, 11 propositions there. Um, because I want to focus in on two and explain why I think two is false, and therefore the argument is unsound. Um, so, um, two is false because it presupposes a certain um, analysis of intrinsicality that I think has been definitively shown to be false in 20th century contemporary analytic philosophy. Um, namely, that if God exists alone, he can't have any extrinsic properties. That's a crucial premise that I think Joe needs. In fact, I think that's the crux of his whole argument. And I think um, it can be demonstrated to be false. So here's a counterexample. The property of being lonely, right? So in addition to all the contingent knowledge that God um, has in the alone world, he also has the property of being alone. 
He's all by himself in that world. Um, and yet his uh, aloneness or his loneliness, however you, uh, obviously loneliness has negative psychological connotations that I don't want here. Um, so maybe it's better to just talk about aloneness. His aloneness is not intrinsic to him. Here's why. We could uh, deprive God of his aloneness without changing anything about God. Okay? How? Well, we could just have something else co come into existence in the world. Of course, God would have to cause that himself. But um, uh, if he did that, right, then something about the world uh, that's totally extrinsic to him would change. Namely, some other thing would come into existence, such as dogs, perhaps, right? And yet, um, uh, he would thereby lose the property of being alone. He would no longer be alone. And so, uh, aloneness is an example of a property that God can have in the alone world, but which nevertheless is extrinsic because you can deprive God of it without, um, uh, without changing anything intrinsic to God. And so the property is extrinsic. Uh, if you can change, if you can give it to the subject or deprive the subject of it without um, changing anything about the subject, that is a clear uh, indication that the property is extrinsic. And that's true of aloneness. So, um, and that, that's sufficient, I think, to defeat premise two. Um, but I'll say, I'll say more, um, right? Because I, I, I've given an example of a property that is, can be had by God in the alone world and which is nevertheless extrinsic. And so two is false. Um, However, uh, I do want to say something about knowledge. And uh, right, what I just said about loneliness, uh, that's not me really speaking. That's um, uh, David Lewis, one of the you know, titans of contemporary analytic philosophy speaking. Um, uh, I will refer your viewers to his work on intrinsicality, um, where he you know, uh, talks about this loneliness test. He attributes it to, to Jang Wan Kim. Um, and uh, it's well understood, I think, in the literature that this is a bad test for intrinsicality uh, because of the counterexample I just mentioned. Um, now, Joe is particularly concerned about knowledge, however, and I think that um, not only uh, is God's knowledge extrinsic, and that's not a problem with him having extrinsic knowledge in the alone world, but you can also see that... Uh, human knowledge is, is extrinsic, and that indeed human knowledge uh, in, the alone, in, in the world where a human being exists alone would also still be extrinsic. So um, let's step back from God for a moment, right, and just think about if I were to exist in a world alone, right? There's no God, nothing else uh, contingent, it's just me. Of course, you know, on the classical model, this is impossible, but um, it still illustrates the, the point. Um, suppose per impossible that I did exist in the alone world and that I knew that um, in this world there are no dogs. It's just me, right? Now, um, you might think that my knowledge is intrinsic to me, um, but that would be wrong. And here's why. Uh, part of knowledge is truth. Um, it, this is in epistemology called the factivity of knowledge, right? Um, it, in, it, it entails truth. If you, you can't know something that's false. Okay, so I am in the alone world all by myself. In that alone world, I know that um, there are no dogs, and yet my knowledge that there are no dogs is not intrinsic to me. Um, because if dogs came into existence, something that has nothing to do with me, that doesn't change me intrinsically in any way, um, I would it would cease to be true that there are no dogs, and therefore I would cease to know that there are no dogs. Um, so even with respect to creaturely knowledge, I think two things are true. Namely, one, that um, knowledge is extrinsic uh, because knowledge depends on truth, and truth is extrinsic. There's just no getting around that. So I think um, we shouldn't be so we shouldn't think it's so weird to hear that divine knowledge is extrinsic because all knowledge is extrinsic because it all entails truth. Uh, and number two, um, uh, the problem here about divine knowledge is not special about special to divine knowledge, right? It, you could just as well have a creature uh, 
whose knowledge uh, who exists in the alone world all by itself and yet whose knowledge is extrinsic to him because it depends on truth and truth is extrinsic. I'll let Joe respond. So Joe, before yeah, you come I am- in, I, I want to do this. So I want to try to see if we can move on to a new objection pretty soon. Sure. Are you, are you guys open yeah. to that? Yeah. I mean, sure. maybe I can get in the last, I mean, I know yeah. I what I was going to suggest, word, but I mean, what I was going to suggest Joe is that you give the last word on this one and then move to a new one because yeah, Chris yeah, took up a substantial amount of time. Okay. Mm, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. So the first thing that I do want to say is that, um, First, for the audience, just note that my argument does not require that there are no extrinsic components of knowledge. I mean, of course, um, truth, if it if it's correspondence with reality or extramental reality, then any knowledge of extramental reality is going to have to require some sort of extrinsic component. So I do want the audience to know that my argument does not hinge on saying that knowledge as such is thoroughly intrinsic or completely intrinsic. Um, it's perfectly compatible with there being some extrinsic element. The second thing that I want to say is that um, I don't see the property of aloneness as a counterexample to premise two, because I know you talked about knowledge in your second objection, but my premise two doesn't talk about properties. It specifically focuses on knowledge, not about properties like the property of aloneness or things like that. I would actually argue that aloneness, uh, the property of being alone is not a property. That's that's what I would argue because it's a sort of, it's a, it's a negative existential. It's uh, this does not exist and that does not exist and that does not exist and that does not exist and the thing in question exists. We're God, for say. Um, so I don't think that it's a, it's a property corresponding to any sort of um, attribute that something has. And so I would deny that as a, as a counterexample. Um, the next thing that I would say is that... Um, once again, uh, my premise talks about a mixture of intrinsic knowledge, uh, intrinsic to God in some respects, but extrinsic in others. So um, even if the truth to which God's knowledge corresponds um, is extrinsic, there's still, I would argue that there's still going to be uh, an intrinsic component to it, which is going to be contingently had by God. And so that, that, that gets to my um, intrinsic to God in some respects, but ex- extrinsic to God in others. That gets to that little proviso or proviso or however it's pronounced. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to say was... Um, I think that truth, if something is true, then it's going to presuppose some sort of correlate within reality uh, that makes it true. Um, you know, truth presupposes in some sense some kind of being. Um, and so if it's a contingent truth that doesn't report a negative existential, I would argue that that is going to be um, presupposing some sort of um, some sort of element in being, some sort of uh, concrete reality or some sort of reality uh, that, that accounts for the truth. Um, so... Uh, what that would mean is that if there is a um, a contingent truth in the alone world, which is not um, which is not strictly speaking uh, one about negative existentials, like God exists alone and there does, does not exist other things, but is instead about some positive reality, a positive reality like God's knowledge of something, or uh, God knows that He chose not to be alone. Right? Um, I think these are going to be sort of positive positive um, predications. And so uh, in my estimation, I think positive predications, uh, if they're going to be true by the correspondence theory of truth, they're going to have to correspond with some feature of reality. And because they're contingently true, I think it has to correspond with some contingent feature of reality. Okay. Uh, that's, I'm done. Sorry for taking up like three minutes for that. But um, I know Christopher will, will definitely have things to say. And, you know, maybe we can go back and forth on this on Facebook with each other, private messages. That'll be fun. Um, but yeah, I, th- I do think we can, we can move on. Um, so, um, the essence and existence one, people can read that. Um, I don't think we're going to get into that. I think we can get into the act potency one, so for the changing knowledge of a, of a changing creation. And maybe maybe this will be, maybe we'll just have to sort of end out with this one, because this one might take a, a little while, but because uh, we're going to get into extrinsic knowledge.